part of me wants to let this out, right? So we we can tell this story, but at the same time, these stories, the water under the bridge. So for me to bring this up again, it's like, right? What are you doing? This is a story about how Australia changed forever. We came from Vietnam. They arrived with hope, but the Vietnamese people were soon demonised. Well, look around you, all these little slanty eyes people buzzing around you. Cô đi Việt Biên. Nếu mà cô không đi thì gia đình con cái cô sẽ chết hết. Thì cô nói thì đi việc biên ra đó có thể là hải tặc, bắn rồi hiếp dâm. Cũng nghĩ trong lòng cô nói rằng thì chắc có lẽ mình đi như vậy. Có thể chết chúng như họ. Nếu mà nó may mắn được vô bờ thì mình sống. Chao Huang is stranded in the South China Sea with her husband and their seven children. They are just one family in a mass exodus of terrified people fleeing the communists following the end of the Vietnam War. Even though they knew they could not weather the open sea, the small boats set out anyway. Recession, racism, the traumas of the past and the isolation of the present are all taking their toll. The head of the family, in particular, is struggling to find his place in a completely alien culture. I think drinking, my dad drinking was, it became sort of like an social thing. So when we came to Australia, he would meet up with his friends and that's what they would do, the Australians would drink. So as far as I remember, Dad would have those weekends where he'd have drinking parties and uncles and friends from all over would come over and drink and drink all night and then it happened again the next day. So I don't remember Dad being an alcoholic in overseas, but yes, it did happen when he was here. I know you know, by his tattoos and everything. He's, he's gone through some stuff in the Vietnam War and, which he never spoke about. I don't want to paint a bad picture about my dad. But um, the alcohol just divided our family. At the time, I think that's why uh, some particular counseling services for men, for Vietnamese men in particular, were so important to the Vietnamese community that we need to help those men. They did not get the support they needed. The chances of the Huangs getting help are slim. Multiculturalism may be a fine theory, but Cabramatta doesn't have the resources to make it work in practice. They did not know how to deal with the situation. They didn't know how to handle it. So therefore they resorted to the traditional way of resolving conflicts. That was to use power and violence. I remember being in my room with my mother, surrounded by my other sisters, she was just crying after my father's beaten her. I'm crying. I remember feeling a rage in my heart. I just quickly wanted to grow up. Mum told us, like, if he's like that, then just quickly try and find somewhere to get out of his face. Because if you were in his face, you were sure to get in trouble, and when you got hit, you would get hit bad. The 
cả mọi người á họ đều có một cái điều gì họ phải khi gia đình của cuộc sống của người úc và gia đình cuộc sống của việt nam nó khác biệt như thế này của việt nam mình á con á nói tới đâu là nó theo cái phong tục của cha mẹ của việt nam thì làm theo tới đó sau khi việt nam mình ở nước úc lâu năm thì lại con cái của mình nó lại trong cái ngôi trường của người của úc As the worlds of white Australia and Asia collide, a generational and cultural chasm is splitting families apart. Started off with my sisters. They ran away. My older sister ran away when she was 14 years old. It really just broke my family apart. I'd never heard of Cabramatta before being posted there. To be honest, I'd never been any further west than Parramatta other than go on holidays. Scott Cook is just 19. Until now, he's enjoyed his teenage years on Sydney's prosperous North Shore. Uh, just prior to getting posted to Cabramatta, there was a murder that took place on the streets of Cabramatta and it, there was a, a newspaper article about it uh, the weekend after I'd been posted. Um, my poor mother um, read that and said to me, where are you going? What are you going to be doing? We were flat chat every day. We had murders, we had kidnappings, we had armed robberies, we had frauds, we had stealings. Predominantly around the streets. Police are maintaining a high profile on the streets of Cabramatta. Overwhelmed, but Cook and his colleagues are starting to gather intelligence on how the criminal underworld operates. These gangsters, many of them were young. Some weren't. Some were Fagan type characters who were older members of the community who were established in organised crime activity who used these young people to do a lot of the robberies and things like that. The gangs may be terrorising a community, but for some young kids in Cabramatta, there's something to aspire to. A place to belong. My older sisters started dating gang members. We used to go and see her. Um, surrounded by these guys, all I saw was that they had nice shoes. They had good clothes and they had a had a bunch of friends that had love you know they cared for each other they fought for each other i saw these guys that they're pretty cool in amongst the mayhem 12 year old tony huang is adolescent and rebelling with all this going on in my heart I guess it just stored up in there until I went to high school. I think it expressed itself in anger, in violence, where I went from school to school always fighting. I got expelled in year seven for fighting. Thì cô cũng không biết nó bị đuổi ra. Sau khi thơ tờ về thì cô mới nghĩ cái thơ mà cô cũng không biết đọc với cô mới cầm theo có cái cô thông dịch ở trong trường á cô đọc ra là thôi đi không có được học nữa thì cô chỉ biết vậy rồi thì về đó Neither Chow nor her husband can speak English and Tony can't speak Vietnamese As in many refugee families the relationship between the parents and the children is lost in translation. Bây giờ á, Tony á, nhiều khi nó muốn nói chuyện với cô rất là nhiều điều mà nó nói không được, nó cứ đập cái đầu nó. Nó cứ nói, mẹ làm sao? Con trả lời được cái này, rồi không được, nó hỏi mấy chị, nói chị, nói hộ dùm cho em. When I was there translating, I would be in a position where I'd have to translate, but in a way where 
I would have to try and hide things for Tony that weren't so good to tell Dad so that it would be, like, you know, it would work out better for Tony on his part. And then not only that, Dad wouldn't misunderstand Tony with, you know, the problems that he had when he was a bit older. The disappointment is and the frustration is for me is that I can't even talk to my parents even if I wanted to. I couldn't share my problems with them if I wanted to. Even up till now, I can't tell my parents how much I love them if I wanted to because of that language barrier. I felt distant from my parents, my sisters and I just felt alone. The ideals of a new Australia are endangered and families who arrived with so much hope just a few years ago are crushed. Their children finally lured to the streets of crime. Mà sau sau 12 12 tuổi á là Tony thay đổi là đi ra đường á là gặp bạn bè á rồi đi chơi với bạn bè thì Tony thay đổi lại nó khác ở nhà. When I go over to my sister's house um, you know, surrounded by these these guys and seeing what they do, seeing the unity they have, the bond they have for each other. I um I felt I felt good, I felt a part of something. I was brought along to the, the clubhouse where, you know, guns, knives lying around, drugs lying around. And so I think I was viewed by them just being so young as the guy, the follower. Being a young boy in the back of a van with eight other guys with bags of machetes. I remember feeling at that time, man, this is serious. I don't know, I was ready to get involved in this. But part of me was like, this is your life. You're gonna go home to your parents. The heroin problem is hardly new, but it's now claiming more Australian lives each year than the Vietnam War ever did. The group of guys that I hung with, they end up being dealers on the street. So after school, they'll go and deal. And uh, I'll just hang with them. Tony Huang is 13 years old. His parents arrived as refugees in 1980. Almost a generation on, like so many Vietnamese families in Cabramatta, they're still struggling. I didn't have much to bring to school. Just looking at other kids, what they had for lunch. And compared to what I had, it was like, man, I'm not well off. Growing up in Australia, going to school, seeing other kids with nice shoes and clothes that fit them. I wanted that. I wanted, I wanted to fit in. Imagine that if, if you are 14, 15 or 16, you can make like 100 bucks a day. That would be very tempted to do so. I keep my eyes peeled, looking at people, seeing what I can learn, who they got it from, how they cut it up, how they packaged it. I saw all this and I took note. I see them make money. To me, having money meant having a future. When this heroin epidemic happened, it was, it was just a, an open door to make money. 
And so I jumped at that opportunity and became a dealer before and after school. 14-year-old Tony Huang has finally worked out the best way of making a living in Cabramatta. After getting rid of my first batch and I had some money in my pocket, man, I felt good. I went to eat and paid for my own meal. And, um, you know, I bought my first pair of Air Max. I'll go to school with bundles of money. I'm eating meat pies. I'm eating lasagna. I'm loving it. Tony's a successful seller on the trade floor of a market dominated by one gang. The infamous 5T are responsible for dealing, robbery and extortion. The train station was the shop front. Ideally, you want to be the first one there. So we would hang around on the ramp and wait for the white people to get off the train. Ultimately, the guys that had good stuff or good gear and good sizes would develop regulars. So they'll bypass every other guy asking them once getting off the train and come directly to you. Very aggressive or vigorous approaches when people would get off the train, people calling out, you know, are you right, you know, hey sis, hey bro, do you want to get on? If you're not Asian and you came off the train, then you can be sure that you get asked to get on. And uh, you'll be asked multiple times before you get across the ramp and onto the other side. I saw them as a way to make money. All I saw about these customers was the money they had. That's the only thing that interested me. I didn't care why they were buying the stuff that I was selling. I just want that money. And so, that's what happened. I didn't care much for them. I used to sit in Cabramatta, um, just outside the railway station in Railway Parade, and I used to sit there and just wait for the trains to come in, and I could tell you how busy it was gonna be by the number of people that got off by the way that they looked, the way, they, the way that they walked, and you could tell that they were users. And um, sometimes you'd get called to the railway station itself, you'd find them on the platform. Many a times we treated them on the platform. You would see them on the street hanging off poles, trying to find their balance, you know, just stone off their heads, uh, rubbing their face, just sleeping on chairs. It was just an ugly and dirty scene. Every day would hear sirens go off and just to make a joke out of it. Another OD on John Street. In Cabramatta, two people die every month from a heroin overdose. Just relax, just relax. Khi đó thì cô thấy Tony thay đổi. Cô có mở cái phòng cô vô cô dọn dẹp á thì cô thấy cái giấy bạc. Cái tờ giấy bạc mà nó có màu đen chấm chấm ở trên đó thì cô không biết cái đó là cái gì. Cô mới hỏi bộ con hút thuốc hả? Tony cũng im lặng không có nói. Tony thì nó khác. À, người thì ốm ra, tóc thì dài, má thì cọp vô, ốm sơ sát. Thế tại sao mà con bệnh hay là sao mà con ốm o như vậy? As with so many of Cabramatta's dealers, temptation has proved too much for Tony. I was really ignorant about the heroin addiction. I just saw it as a means to make money. But here I am in school and I'm feeling withdrawals 
So um, I go to the shed and um, and I smoke some heroin, and I feel better. Thì cảm giác của cô cũng buồn phiền. Tại sao mà phải dính vô cái chuyện như vậy? Cô cũng không biết làm sao hết. Cô rất là đau khổ. Tại vì có một mình con trai trong nhà mà nó làm như vậy, cô đau đớn lắm. I was just there at the station like any other day. I was approached by uh, a, a, a guy that uh, was asking for, to get on. We did the deal. The moment he went, another two people, having been undercovers, came and grabbed me, handcuffed me, put me against the fence and just waited for a paddy wagon to come. I was more worried about seeing my parents than anything else. Because I'm, I'm in my hometown and my mum shops there. But I felt ashamed just having been standing there handcuffed while people were walking past looking at me. I felt embarrassed. Có, có nhiều khi cô nghĩ mình đã dấp phải những cái bom đạn súng bắn ở Việt Nam. Mình đã thoát khỏi qua đây. Thì mình nghĩ rằng mình đã tất cả những gì mình đã sung sướng rồi. Mình đâu có dính nếu về mọi cái sự mà mình sợ chết nữa. Nhưng mà ngược lại là mình con mình nó phải dính vào cái chỗ này. Thế hồi uh, tôi đi uh, cảnh sát uh, bắt á, cái đó là cô không có hiểu. Một con người mẹ mà sinh ra một đứa con Thì một đứa con đó, nó mỗi đứa nó có một cái ý riêng của nó Nó thích cái gì thì nó làm Cho nên nó cô đó, không có hiểu tại sao mà nó phải làm như vậy Thành ra cô rất là mắc cỡ I got my phone call, I, I called my mum. I just remember her saying, you got yourself into it, you get yourself out of it. And just hung up on me. I just felt like I, can, I can't do anything right. I can't even do drugs right. I felt useless. This is all I knew. All I knew growing up was violence and dealing drugs. And to me, that was my life. Those are like the cards I've been dealt. This is, this is you. Để cho nó chết thì nó ở trong đó luôn đi. Đó, đừng có gọi về đây nữa. Đó là có cô bây giờ cô nhớ lại đây. Can't tell you how I felt, but it, it hurt. Tony's sentenced to six months in juvenile detention. He joins hundreds of other Vietnamese children who've been incarcerated. People labelled Cabramatta as a bad place from just the minority of the people that, like me, got on drugs, did bad things, and gave Cabramatta and our community a bad rep. Tony Huang is 15 years old. He's serving a six-month sentence in juvenile detention. Drug dealing, his way of escaping the poverty of a refugee family. Thì trong lòng cô rất là lo cho Tony rất là nhiều. Nhưng mà ngoài miệng cô á, thì cứ nói rằng á, để cho nó chết đi, nó theo bạn bè. Nó hư hỏng như vậy thì để cho nó chết hay là nó đi đâu cho khuất mắt. Đừng có trở về đây nữa. Ngoài miệng cô thì nói như vậy. Nhưng mà trong cái tấm lòng của cô á, lúc nào cũng cầu nguyện làm sao cho con mình bỏ, bỏ đi. At the time of my release, I felt freedom. 
And so I was confronted with two choices to make. Either go back to school, make my parents proud, or go back to the life I knew growing up. I made a dumb choice. And I continued dealing drugs. Tony steps out into the heroin capital of Australia and goes back to making a living in a place that appears to have become an abandoned hell. We just made a killing. I enjoyed this life because of the money I was making. I enjoyed it when I sat down in, in one of the rooms and just counted all the cash that I had. Put 10 grand in each glad bag and just stacked them up. I brought everything that I wanted as a little kid. All the shoes, the clothes. I spent thousands on uh, remote control cars. Even though it's a bad thing, um, what I remember about Tony and during the time that he was doing well I remember happy times. I remember lots of money spent on everything and anything and everything that he always wanted. I remember going out to eat, like every meal of the day was restaurant, restaurant, restaurant. And it wasn't just him, it was like a whole entourage, should we say. It was, it was the good life. Premier Bob Carr hopes a special drug summit could be the start of something. I mean, we're talking here about victims and about vultures. But for many, like dealer Tony Huang, it's already too late. All the money that I had, all the things that I bought, came at a cost to me. I relapsed on heroin. I'll take up to two grams a day. Um, I was first smoking it, and then I started injecting heroin, which really destroyed my life. I lost a close friend of mine at 16 years old to a heroin overdose. I was so blinded by drugs, I didn't go to the funeral. He had wanted to quit a lot of times and it was like quitting and not quitting and wanting to quit. I think he pretty much was at a point where, you know, he had done it for too long, you know, he had come to the point where, yes, he was going to do it, it's, you know, it's, it's enough. What I'll do at times is I'll go into my room, lock the door behind me and I'll sit there tie up my arm and before I'll shoot it in my veins. And I'll say, God, if, if you can deliver me from this, then please do it. Death has become part of life in Cabramatta. I can't stand this life that I'm living. On and off drugs, in and out of prison, Having friends die, I'm at the end of myself. And so I go back to the church that I was raised up in. I cried and I poured out my heart before God. I asked him with tears in my eyes running down my face, if you are there, then please give me a sign. I got up from there. And I went home. I was walking through Cabramatta. This guy handed me a flyer with the words written on it. If you're looking for a sign from God, here it is. In the middle of the BKK mall where everyone knew me as a dealer, I burst out crying and weeping. I tell you, I received redemption right there on the street in Cabramatta. It was hard for, for me to just put that life away, 
for eight, nine years of my life, this is all I knew. But having come to Christ and knowing what he went through for me, it didn't happen, happen overnight that I got off drugs. I had to make some hard choices, choices to cut off some bad influences, to see what I wanted for my life and make a choice and a decision to change. It was very, very difficult. But I made those choices and today I'm clean. I'm free. I'm so free, you lock me up today, I'll be free. <laughs> if I can influence one life to not live the life that I've lived and escape that pain, then that's my drive. It's my duty is to, is to lead them away from that kind of life and do what I can in understanding, having gone through it, show them a different way and a better way. My father now, he's, he's no longer abusive. I know and I feel that he is thinking in his heart, that's my son and that I love him and our relationship has restored. My relationship with my sisters have restored. My relationship with people. I speak to people and strangers off the street like they're my best friend. I could never do that in the past. I have a love in my heart which God has put there, which is amazing. <laughs>